Good morning, everybody. I want to welcome you this day to Mount Calvary United Methodist Church. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen, church? And brothers and sisters, as we get started this morning, just a couple of announcements to bring to your attention. Um, it says that we have Thursday morning Bible study in our bulletin. We actually don't have that this week, so Thursday morning, folks, you get a week off. Next Sunday, we will be having a combined service at 10 a.m. outside over by uh, in the grass, over by the pavilion, and we're going to have a picnic afterwards, so bring some food and a plate and uh, get ready to have a good meal and a good time together as a church family. If you need to get Father's Day sentiments in, I believe that the papers are still back by the offering plates in the back of the sanctuary, and um, you can take those, fill those out, and place those in the box by the narthex. If you're interested in helping out by providing some uh, special music during the summer, that information's in the bulletin. We invite you to uh, talk to Donna Hetrick about that. And I'm excited on, on uh, September, on June 25th, a very good friend of mine named Jennifer Lake is coming to speak to us about a program that she created called Dwell Orphan Care. She was supposed to be with us back in October, I believe, of last year, but then she got COVID and we respectfully asked her to stay away. And so she is not with COVID anymore, and she is going to be with us to share some of the wonderful things about her program, but also to give us a wonderful message as well. Are there any other announcements that need to be made this morning? Seeing none, it is indeed good to be here and worship today, and let us have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, this morning as we gather to be in your presence Lord, may we be able to set aside all of the distractions from the outside world and be able to completely and totally focus on you. Thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for being a part of our life that we can worship and honor you today. We pray these things in your name, and all of God's children said, Amen.
Amen. Thank you, Barb. And now, brothers and sisters, it's our chance to make a joyful noise. And so I want to invite us to stand together, and we're going to join in verses 1, 2, 3, and 7 of all creatures of our God and King. Let's stand and sing. I'd like to invite the children forward for children's time this morning. Good morning, kiddos. Good morning. How are you guys today? All righty. I'm actually going to give you guys an announcement. In two weeks, we're going to start something during children's time that we used to do before COVID, and we're going to do it for the summer. It's called Stump the Pastor. And what's going to happen is you guys are going to get a bag, and one of you each week We'll get to put something in that bag during the week, bring it here to church, and then I don't know what it is, and when you get to church during this time, you'll hand it to me, and I'll pull out whatever it is, and I have to figure out a way to connect it to God or Jesus. It can be anything that you want. We're going to start in two weeks. The only rules are it has to fit in the bag, it cannot be sharp, so it can't stab me, and it cannot be alive. So those are the three... <laughs> Yeah, you cannot bring in a cockroach. Absolutely. <laughs> Definitely no bugs. <laughs> if I do, I'll throw it that way. Sorry, Nicole, but it's coming towards you. 
That technically is viable. It is. Yes, edible is also allowed, but it can't poison me. Alrighty, guys. So, but for today, I have a question for you. If I handed you car keys, would you know how to drive a car? <laughs> okay. You may think you know how to drive a car, but you may discover it's a little bit more difficult once you got behind the wheel. How about this? All right. How many of you guys have or have used one of these? Okay, most uh, everyone probably has. So you guys know how to turn it on, make it do all kinds of stuff, right? But do you understand how the inner workings of the phone work? Like if I gave you all the microchips and stuff, would you be able to put it together to make it work? Yeah, I have the correct tools, yeah. If you had the correct tools, yes? Okay. All righty, guys. Well... <laughs> Sometimes we have to admit that we don't totally know or understand things, whether it's how to drive a car, even if we think we do, or maybe how a phone or a computer works. The other thing, there are other things I don't think I understand, like why did God decide to make mosquitoes? I don't find them to be necessary. Or why do we drive on a parkway or park on a driveway? That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Well, today, we're going to talk about something that can be a little bit tough to understand, even for adults. And Ava was the only one here last week. She may know a little bit more about this than the rest of y'all, but it's called the Holy Trinity. Who can tell me what three persons are in the Holy Trinity? Henry. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's very good. So the Trinity comes from the word tri, which means three. And the Trinity tells us how God is three people, but that he's also one person. So some of us get really confused by that. How can God be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but all of them be God, all of them be one person, but then there's also three? That doesn't really make sense. Some people have tried to explain it over the years using different images. Like, I'll show you one on the screen here. So you can look at the screen, or if you can see in the back too, that works. So you can see this is an egg. And so some people describe an egg as being like the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, because you've got the outer shell, the yolk, and then the white part. Some people have also decided or tried to use ice or water as the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, because you've got the Father as ice, the Son as water, and the Holy Spirit as steam that comes for when you heat water. So there's some different ways we try to explain that. Like all three of those are water, but they all take different forms. For me, my favorite way to think about the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is as we live as people. So I'm, to you guys, I'm pastor. To my children, I'm father. To my wife, I'm husband. To my mother, I'm a son. And so, but in all of those things, I'm still Jim. Nothing ever stops me from being Jim, but I am also all of those other things depending on where I'm at in my life. And so here's the key thing to remembering the Trinity. It's difficult to understand, but it's important because even though, because it allows us to see how God loves us and takes care of us. At the end of the day, we may not fully understand what it means, and that's okay, but having some elements of mystery can actually make things more fun. If we knew everything in the world, it wouldn't be that exciting. And so there are things about God we will never fully understand while we're on earth, but when we get to heaven, we finally will. And, but what we do know now is that God is with us, that he loves us, and that he's always here for us. So we're going to say a prayer, and let us bow our heads and repeat after me. God, I love you, and I know you love me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you hand me the lollipops? All right. You guys can each have a lollipop, and I look forward to seeing you on the road. What are you whispering about, Coleman? Nothing. You better be giving those to your whole row. I don't know, see, Harz, that Coleman had some plans going on there up front with the lollipops. 
And brothers and sisters, we now come to a time of sharing of the heart. And one of the things I do want to lift up um, is actually one more announcement, and that is following services this morning at the 9 a.m. service, before the 11 a.m. service, we're going to have a game over in the fellowship hall, Are You Smarter Than a Mount Calvary UMC Child? And uh, we're going to get to see the children's ministry here show off all the things that they've learned over the last year here at Mount Calvary. So we certainly want to invite you over to the fellowship hall, grab some snacks, and then we're going to have a, a good show for you. Eric, is there anything else we need to know other than that? Cool. Very cool. But now it is time to share in praises and prayer requests. What do we have to lift up for the body of Christ this day, friends? Yeah, Dakota. Praise God for a fun senior week with smart decisions. That's excellent. Cecilia. And Libby graduated. Absolutely. And I think, Dakota, you graduated. On Wednesday, you'll graduate. Excellent. Do we have any other graduates in here from high school or college? Nope. All right. Excellent. And listen to him about the senior week thing. Good decisions for senior week. She's going with you? What a lame senior week. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Hand on heart, true story. I wasn't going on my senior week, but a friend of mine, um, his mom said he wasn't allowed to go unless I went because she knew I wouldn't let him die. So that's how I ended up going on my senior week. Other prayers or praises to lift up today? Yes, Ellie. Oh my gosh, yeah, we finally got some rain. We could use a little bit more of it, but absolutely, praise God for that. I'm going to save you for last. I'm going to save you for last. She's not listening. All right, Yvonne, come on up and share with us what you want to share. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to be here. Amen. And I just want to give God the glory. I told him all throughout the past year when I was finally healed, um, from my, all my afflictions, I would, I would stand up and give the glory to God and thank him for all he did for me through that whole time. Last year, I, well, I've had multiple abdominal problems um, for, well, let's say the first time I think was when our great, great nephew was born and he just graduated from high school. So that's how long things have been going on. But this last fiasco started on May 21st of 2020. And on May 26th, I was in surgery. In June, I had two more surgeries. And following that, I had an open wound in my abdomen from the whole time, from that time forward uh, until April 27th, this, just this past April 27th. I had wound care nurses coming in one especially Jody, she was absolutely fantastic and knew what she was doing and very loving and kind. And also when she wasn't available, my husband Blaine was able to fill in and he did so much for me too. And I just want to thank, thank him. And I'm, on fr uh, Friday, we were at the surgeon and he looked at my incision and he said, it's healed. You don't need to come back anymore. Go out and have a normal life. And he told Blaine, he said, you can pack up all your medical supplies and put them away. The prior visit, he looked at the dressing Blaine had put on and he said, oh, I forgot you have a PhD in wound care. Because <laughs> <laughs> he got so good at it. But, um, and I also want to thank Pastor Jim and my Mount Calvary Church family for all the acts of kindness, all the cards you get, you sent, all the well wishes and encouragement and um, promises for healing in the cards, the phone calls, the visits, the delicious food. Oh, I, I don't know if I can remember everything. I have a new uh, fl permanent flower arrangement on, on our kitchen table now. Um, we have a planner on the front porch, thanks to some uh, good people from Mount Calvary. And you've all been wonderful. I, I just thank you all for helping me to get through this. Without your prayers, 
and, every, and the Lord working and providing guidance and wisdom to the doctors and my, the healthcare professionals and my husband, I wouldn't be here where I am today. And I just give him the glory. I praise him for all he's done for me. And thank you, everybody. Amen. Thank you, Yvonne. <laughs> There's a scripture that says, what can stop me from praising the Lord? And as Yvonne was coming up and I was trying to tell her I'm going to save you for last, she was like, nothing's going to stop me from praising the Lord right now. And Yvonne, we've been praying so hard for you. There's been so many times we thought that maybe you were going to go into the Lord. And we're so grateful for everything that you are at now, where you're at now. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Yvonne. Thank you so much for sharing that joy. And friends, with that, why don't we join in our hymn of prayer, the first verse of Freely, Freely. Let us pray. Indeed, almighty and gracious God, we are grateful for the wonders of our day, the beautiful words of healing that you bring into our lives, and the way, God, that you get us through the most tumultuous of times into a sea of love that is only placed in our lives because of you. But Lord, we also know there are folks going through pain and hurt right now. We pray that whether it's physical, emotional, mental, or spiritual, that you would bring them to a place of healing. We know, God, that you freely give and we freely receive all that you bless us with, but may our lives be a reflection of that truth and the statement of our love for you. And now, Jesus, in honor of you, we pray the prayer you taught your disciples to pray in saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done <clears throat> on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> Do we have children's church today, Erica? No, no CCT. All right, at this time then, I'd like to invite Beth Byers forward with our scripture reading this morning. As Beth makes her way forward, just want to invite you watching on YouTube to hit that like button, follow, subscribe, and leave a comment, ring the bell, do a dance, send pizza, and all that you got to do on YouTube. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Today's scripture reading is Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. 
This is the word of God for the people of God. And together we say, thanks, thanks be, be to, God. to God. Thank you, Beth, and let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, on this day, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, may these be your words, O God, not mine. Amen. <clears throat> Sorry. One of the questions over the years that I've been asked as a pastor, I don't want to say the most, but it's definitely probably in the top 10, is to explain the Trinity. And the truth is, the Trinity can be extremely difficult to explain. We were talking about a little bit with the kiddos this morning, how you can have three persons and one person. They're all different, but they're all the same. They have individual names, but they're all God. And <clears throat> we're going to talk some today about how it's important to understand that though we may not understand, the one that's in control understands. And the truth is, we have to do this a lot with different areas of our lives. Sometimes when we get an answer about God that we just have to trust him, we think that that can be kind of a cop-out. But how often do we give our lives or entrust our lives to others when we don't fully understand, whether it's we're flying on a plane or we go to a doctor, because we know that they know what they're doing. In fact, just a, a couple of weeks ago, I saw that example where we were at Henry's Spring Concert, and unfortunately, a kiddo um, got overcome by the heat and collapsed. And Cheryl Blaha, who, if you don't know her as a, as a nurse, um, was sitting with us. And as I looked over to her, she was already leaping out of her seat to run over to the kid because she's trained and she knows what she's doing. And fortunately, the kiddo ended up being okay. But again, we trust the people that know what they're doing. And when it comes to understanding the Trinity, we may not totally get it, but we trust that God understands and because of that, we are blessed. At the same time, we want to talk a little bit today about different aspects of the Trinity because what we can't understand is extremely important. And so, you know, the Trinity really appears most prevalently during Jesus' baptism. As Jesus goes into the water, he, he um, is baptized by John the Baptist, and the scriptures tell us, and the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. And so that's one of the very few places we see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all in action together. But again, we see them as three individuals in that case, and yet they all are one God. And we try to come up with different ways to explain it. I shared some of those with the kids this morning. But none of them are perfect. You know, we had the egg example, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But in this case here, each of those substances is different. You know, the shell, the yolk, and the, um, the white part. Does the white part have a name? No, just egg white? Okay, cool. The shell, the, the, the yolk, and the egg white all are different substances. And so God isn't different substances. He's one God, even in three persons. We talked about the ice and the water and the steam. Well, that's all one substance. It's H2O. But it's also something that's different than God. In order to get those three things, there has to be an outside force that changes it. Nothing outside of God changes God. God is always God. So that's also not perfect. One I just came across I'd never heard before is the sun, where the sun represents the Father, the light of the sun represents Christ, and the heat of the sun represents the Holy Spirit. But again, without the initial sun, you can't have the other two. And God exists as three persons, even though he's still one. And so, again, interesting idea. I actually like that, but... It's not perfect. Even the example that I shared is my personal favorite, where I am Jim, but I'm also different roles in my life. I think maybe that's the closest of all of the different examples, but there's one really big important difference, that I am mortal, and one day I will die. God is eternal, and he offers me eternal life. 
No matter what, it's important to recognize how God works in our lives. But one of the questions that also comes up at times when it comes to the Trinity is, okay, you've got Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I can accept the fact that it's three different persons, but one. But who is... How did that come up again? There we go. But who is superior? Some people think, well, God the Father's clearly superior. He created everything. But Jesus is the one who saves us. He must be superior. But the Holy Spirit is active in our lives. So is he superior? And in fact, this single question here is really why we have Christian denominations today and not just one church. Because about a thousand years ago in 1054 AD, there were two halves of the church. There was the West, which was Rome, which was Catholicism, and the East, which is what we call Orthodox. And they were debate, they were at that time one church. And they were debating what the roles were of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's called the Filioque controversy. And basically, it came down to one very little difference. In the Nicene Creed, which is like our Apostles' Creed, the Orthodox would say, we believe in the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father. The Catholics said, we believe in the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Those three extra words there, and the Son, are one of the main reasons why today we don't have one singular church in the world. Because at that point, it's split into two halves, creating Catholicism and Orthodoxy, and then eventually Catholicism split off into Protestantism, which then split off into all kinds of things, including Methodism, which is why we are here today. But basically, this controversy came down to, is the Father superior or is everyone equal? Because when it says proceeds from the Father for the Holy Spirit, it actually doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit is less than, it just means that he's of the same substance as of the Father and the Son. This ends your uh, Masters of Divinity theology class on the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And now we're going to get into the guts of our conversation here, which is why is it important to understand the Trinity? We heard this passage at the end of the verse that Beth read. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. In that passage there, as simple as it seems, that mention of Jesus telling us to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit indicates how important the Trinity is to our relationship with it, with God. You know, first of all, Jesus in this passage here is saying that the Trinity, it is through the Trinity by which we share our faith. It's not just we pray in the name of the Father, or we pray just in the name of Jesus, though we tend to do that. It's that we do these things in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Also, the Trinity represents how God works in all facets of our lives. And in fact, our Methodist connection and history actually gives us a great example of what that can look like. Again, no example of the Trinity is perfect. But this one, I think, is pretty close. You see, in United Methodism, we have one aspect of our theology that makes us a little bit unique, which is why I, can, I really connect with it. And that is our founder's understanding of grace. His name is John Wesley. And he talked about three forms of grace that determine what our faith journey is like. The first is called prevenient grace which is talking about how God works in our life before we even recognize we have a relationship with him. The second is called justifying grace, which is when we accept Christ as our savior and we are in fact saved. And the third is called sanctifying grace. And in sanctifying grace, we learn about what our journey with Christ is like. If you believe in Jesus as your savior today, you're in the sanctifying grace phase of things because you're trying to grow into who God has created you to be. In a sense, I really think these three ideas connect with the Holy Trinity. For example, prevenient grace really connects me with the Father, because the Father has had my best intentions in his mind since before I was even born. And in fact, the Trinity has existed long before any of us were ever created. We know this from Genesis 1:26. Then God said, let us you notice the plural word there? Let us 
make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. You see, all the way back in Genesis 1.26, we may not hear the word Trinity. Actually, the word Trinity isn't even used in the Bible. It's a concept we've created to describe the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But even all the way back at creation, when God was dreaming this and dreaming us into existence, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit said, we'll make mankind in our image. And because of that, because we're created in the image of God, we know that we are loved, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we can recognize that because in God's prevenient grace, he's led us to this place today. See, God's grace is what lets your parents, grandparents, friend, whomever it is, bring you to church. Provenient grace is what led to you asking questions about who God is that made you consider coming to church. Provenient grace is what laid something upon your heart when you were going through the worst moments of your life to say, I need something. I just don't understand what. And God just whispered in your ear, it's me. It's me. That's God's provenient grace in action. His creating, loving, and embracing grace that leads us to a place of knowing him today. But then there's God's justifying grace that can only come through the Son. There's two passages that allow us to know how Jesus is at work as the Son in our lives. In John 20, 22, we read, and with that, he, being Jesus, breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. This echoes a moment that happens much earlier in Scripture in the book of Genesis when we read that then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. The breath of life comes from God. The breath of life comes from the Son. The breath of life is the Holy Spirit. It comes from the Father and the Son. And Jesus himself is the only means by which we can receive that breath and that life of the Holy Spirit today. When we accept Christ into our heart, when we say, Jesus, I believe in you as my Lord and Savior, it's not just that we receive a ticket to heaven. We also receive a ticket to experiencing heaven here on earth that's called the Holy Spirit. For when Jesus breathed the Holy Spirit on, onto his disciples 2,000 years ago, he also created a means by which you take in the Holy Spirit when you say yes to him too. And you see, when Jesus justifies us, and one of the ways to remember that Jesus connects us to justifying grace is that when we believe in Jesus, we are saved. And so it's justified, never sinned. That's how Jesus works in our lives. That's how the Trinity works in our lives, to bring salvation into our life through the Son. But then there is that beautiful and amazing gift that gift of the Holy Spirit. We talked about the Holy Spirit some last week. That is God's sanctifying grace. You see, Jesus tells us actually even before he breathes the Holy Spirit into us that the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. You see, brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit is in you today. The Holy Spirit has gifted you today. The Holy Spirit has laid upon your heart a burden to see a better world than what we see today. And the Holy Spirit has also laid upon our hearts that we need to be better ourselves than what we exist as today. As we take the journey of God's sanctifying grace, it means that we are meant to become more and more like Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is that which whispers in our ear those moments in which we know we're taking directions and making choices that don't reflect God's love. Some of us call it a conscience. conscience. I think that what we call a conscience is really the Holy Spirit trying to let us know God is with you. And he knows you know better. And he knows you know what to do. 
And so we, as Christians, are called to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, allow him to work within us so that we can bring into this world, then, the immensity of God's love that can change the world. And so, friends, in the Holy Trinity, we have a connection of how we are meant to live our faith. We have really an explanation of the different ways that God engages in our lives, but perhaps most importantly than anything else, we have a foundational truth that we are never apart from God, his love or his grace in this life. Because before you were even a dream in your parents' eye, God already had dreams for you, and he still does. When you accepted Christ into your life, God's love was there to receive you. No matter what mistakes you had made in the past, no matter what sins you had committed, in that moment, Jesus said, I love you and I forgive you. Welcome to the team. And we have the Holy Spirit that continues to let us know that we are loved, that we are always in God's presence, and that he is always inside of us. We can ignore it. We can pretend like it's not there. We can put other things in our lives to distract us from it. We can even believe that he's not there. But it doesn't make it any less true. We can turn our backs on God, but he will never turn his back on us. And that's the thing that we need to understand today more than anything else when it comes to our relationship with God is that he wants the very best for us. That he wants us to know the incredible nature of his love. That he wants us to know that in every aspect of our life, he is present. And in those moments in which we were downcast and broken and hurting, he wasn't standing there going, wow, that's too bad. He was giving us whatever it was that we needed so that we could step out, step away, and take a new step forward into life once again. And even if now you feel like you're in that place of brokenness, of hurt, like there's no purpose, like there's no no hope. God wants you to know that he hurts for you, that he weeps for you, but that his love has never left you. And that there's a Holy Spirit inside of you that is like a fire burning, and that fire may be as dim as it's ever been, but it is ready to be ignited all the more as we accept the fact that God loves us and there is nothing we can do about it. And so today, church, I just encourage you to know that we will never fully understand God and we sure will never fully understand how the Trinity works. But what we can understand is that the Trinity reflects God's eternal love for us, his hope for who we can be, and his guidance to help us get to that place. Because ultimately, that's what God's love is all about. And so when you leave today, ask yourself, where you're seeing the creative love of the Holy Trinity in your life. Embrace it and thank God for it. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are indeed grateful for the presence of the Holy Trinity. And though we may not totally understand the difference in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and though we may in human words try to place those into our conscience, into our lives, into our understanding, so that way we can try to comprehend more than anything, God, may we trust in you. Trust that you forgive us when we ask for forgiveness. Trust that you love us even in those moments we don't deserve it. And trust that you have offered us eternal life even when it seems like there's nothing worth living for, God. Because you give us that. You give us purpose. You give us hope. And you promise us an eternity filled with joy and blessing if we believe in you. And so, Jesus, today, may your Trinity, or not your Trinity, may you, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, guide our lives and our hearts as we continue a life of love and ministry. We pray this in your name, and all of God's children said, amen. And now, brothers and sisters, we prepare our hearts to join in the most amazing act of love, 
a representation of it, the most amazing act of love in human history, the holy sacrament of holy communion. And so I invite you to turn to page four in your bulletins or look upon the screens as we join our liturgy this morning. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. Indeed, God, you are everything we need in our lives. And because of that, all we need to be is grateful, listening, and receiving of your love. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Indeed, holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and spirit. Indeed, on the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread and he broke it, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the meal was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. God, we ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. In your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at this heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. This morning, brothers and sisters, we have a couple different ways to receive communion. The first is by intention, in which you will receive a piece of bread, dip it into the cup, and then partake. 
This can be a messy process, but it's nothing compared to the messiness Jesus endured on the cross for us 2,000 years ago. Secondly, if you're concerned about germs and cross-contamination, we have a plate up here that has combo cups of wafer and juice in them. You're welcome to come forward, receive one of those, take it back to your seat, and serve yourself communion in a prayerful manner. Finally, if you have a gluten allergy, we have a small plate here with gluten-free bread. Just indicate your need for that, and we'll make sure that you get it. In the United Methodist Church, we have an open table for Holy Communion. That means you don't have to be Methodist or even baptized to receive the sacrament today. All you have to be is a believer in Jesus. And with that said, I'd like to invite those forward who are going to be assisting with Holy Communion this morning.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this day for Holy Communion, what it represents in our lives, the forgiveness of our sins. And God, we pray that we, when we return to your table, we will not be struggling in the same areas that we do today. But God, we're grateful that even if we do, you give us another chance to know we can be forgiven. We pray these things in your name, and all of God's children said, amen. I invite us now to join in our final hymn this morning, Go Make of All Disciples. Please stand. Next week, worship is at 10 a.m. outside, and uh, it's a picnic afterwards, so bring something to share with the congregation. But for now, I invite you to go this day in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, living out the love of the Trinity in your life. Go in peace and serve the Lord, and remember that God loves you, and there's nothing you can do about it. Amen.